<laughs> hello, hello. Hello. Uh, that was a uh, most amazing experience watching that film. Um, I just want to uh, introduce you. Um, though you, we feel that we know you very well. <laughs> Yeah, that, that that was uh you know kind of your book was introduced, but um uh as uh currently um you are associate professor in history at uh, the uh, University of John Hopkins in Baltimore, um but this year you're on um uh sabbatical I understand so I imagine you might you might be geographically delinked from the east coast time but uh it's really great that you could join us tonight um we've we've got uh some uh many questions we've built through seeing the trailer and preparing for this evening but um, uh just to st start uh, I I wonder whether you might tell us a little bit about how you began to get involved in this project and just your connection to the team and how that uh, kind of whole thing happened. Yeah, you bet. Um, and can everyone hear me well? Does the does the sound <laughs> sound good? Okay, good, good. Well, and let me just say what, what a treat it is to be here tonight. Um, as, as some of you might know, I did used to live in Pittsburgh. I taught at the University of Pittsburgh um, for five or six years. So. Uh, I, I'm sorry I can't be there in person with all of you. Uh, in fact, the, the film is having its theatrical release premiere tomorrow night uh, in New York. So I'm coming to you from, from New York at the moment. Uh, so thank you for letting me sort of, you know, rev up my excitement uh, even before moving into the, into the cinematic premiere um, tomorrow. So, you know, it's a really interesting, I, I, I love starting with this question in part because you might not know this for watching the film, but I was the very last person to get involved in framing Agnes, uh, the very, very last one. Uh, you know, this film had its start as a short that Chase Joint, um, you know, worked on a number of years ago that had premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival. I had seen that short, you know, I thought it was fantastic, really interesting. And of course, I sort of knew Chase, we kind of knew each other um, in the sort of academic uh, kind of world, cross paths very often. You know, I had a really, really high esteem for his work, for Kristen Schultz's work, um, for Morgan M. Page's work. But actually, I didn't get involved in this film until 2020. It's uh, one of those kind of COVID silver linings, I guess we'll call them. Um, you know, we were, you know, rewind to the spring of 2020 and, and everyone was just sort of stuck at home and we didn't know for how long. And, and for Chase, that meant among other things, this project, you know, much of which had been filmed, all of a sudden had ground to a halt. And it was sort of starting to become clear, you know, that we just didn't know when, for example, film production might resume. And so Chase being, you know, ever willing to take up any opportunity, reached out to me and said, you know, he's just sort of trying to figure out what to do with this film while he has all this time on his hands. And so very innocently asked me, would you just sit down on Zoom? Could we just talk, just talk shop? Let's just talk about trans history, um, talk about Agnes, talk about other trans people from this era. And of course, you know, it's always a treat to get to really dial in with people who, you know, who know some of the same archives and historical figures as you. But I thought it was just a conversation, uh, but it was one of those fateful moments where, you know, after that first Zoom call, I hung up and thought, well, that was just way too interesting. Like something more has to come of this. So originally we were just talking for a couple of months. And then, you know, later on in 2020, when it became clear that, you know, maybe there was a window to, you know, to reopen, um, to, to, to shoot more, you know, of the film safely, that's when Chase, you know, suggested that maybe actually I ought to come out to LA and, and become the narrator. Um, and that was really, kind of an astonishing uh, experience for me and, and one that I hadn't necessarily expected. But um, what that really means is that basically quite a lot of the film had already been shot, most of it. And then um, I sort of arrived you know, in LA, sat down with the team, watched the rough assembly of the footage so far. And we just kind of had this marathon kind of session together thinking about where the film was going and what it might become. And it was on that basis then that we went out and shot the parts in which you see me. So kind of really interesting to, 
to say that because, you know, if not in some ways for being delayed, well, one, I never would have been a part of the film necessarily, but also it wouldn't have taken shape the way it did. So I just think it's a really interesting testament to sometimes, you know, getting slowed down can actually be a really rare opportunity to take more time with something very complex. Uh, and the difference between the, the short and the fully realized film is a profound difference uh, imagining it without the narration or the intercut. So was there uh, any, uh, was it a very straight documentary in its first version as a short? Or how, mm. how, how, how do you look back at that piece of work and like it or dislike it? I mean, it's completely transformed by its expansion. That's right. You know, I mean, I adore the short. I think it really, you know, it did so much. I mean, you know, at the time, just as a as a fan, right, as a as an audience member myself. But the film or excuse me, the short already started to pick up on something. I mean, Chase's work is always reinventing the genre and really pushing the limits of documentary. And I think the kernel that you could see from the short carrying through that really bloomed really interesting is one, the idea of collaborative sort of team-based documentaries. So assembling, you know, a wide array of people who all contribute to the film in a creative aspect. Uh, and so in that sense, although, you know, the feature was co-written by Chase and Morgan and Page, you know, written, right, you know, sort of written in, in, to a certain extent, um, set up a certain way, but then we have this centrality of, uh, of these actors, right? Picking up these transcripts that were found uh, at the UCLA or, you know, in the sort of personal papers of Garfinkel and kind of having to figure out what to do with them, how to perform them in a way that doesn't just remind us, you know, that, you know, that, that, you know, that we all sort of give performances in everyday life, but in a way that really denaturalizes, um, you know, any sort of scene in which trans people have to give an account of themselves. So I think that that kernel to me looked like it was really kind of sewn in the short, but you needed the space and the time of a feature to let that breathe, right? Just to actually put these folks um, both sort of on stage in the sense of on screen in the talk show format, then, you know, in the sort of uh, off stage behind the scenes interviews uh, with Chase, which are not at all you know, off screen either, it turns out, and then to add in a layer, right, um, of me also going on a little bit of an archival journey. So I think really that kind of kernel grew and grew and grew. Um, but in some ways, it's very organic, right? It, I kind of really think there's something, you know, it, it really came down to even in, at the editing phase, right? We we're still figuring out what is this film, you know, most or <laughs> not what is it about, right? But how is it going to move in certain directions and not others? So I really think that that process has been probably underway since the short, but but doesn't it just get to really soar, you know, when you have 75 minutes to do it? I, I love the comment that you made where you were pointing to the inclusion of the greater crowd, which is the audience that, yes. uh, and uh, the, the kind of layers of critique that they, actor in repeating the words in a different way and then the the kind of way the film is constructed around that actor their lives their uh, and your interrogation mm. and then our interrogation which brings us to maybe bringing a little question from the floor uh would or one of you guys like to come up speak into this microphone um who's going to do it Kat is going to do it because Go on. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Please count here. Hello. Hi. Um, okay, so my question was, are any, I have a couple questions, but I'll start with, are any of the people um, in those transcripts still alive today? And was that, was that an effort to reach out to any of them? Mm, it's a great question. You know, <laughs> We don't know for sure. It's a kind of, it's a funny, funny answer you have to give. And it involves the really boring kind of meat and potatoes of research ethics, right? Which is like, presumably many of them are, right? You know, some of them are quite young when they're being interviewed. I mean, for example, you know, Jimmy is still like a teenager. Even Agnes is, is quite young. Um, and a few of the other people, you know, seem to be at least to me, you know, in their in their early 20s or something like that. So they they could be alive. I mean, they'd be quite old, right? Mm -hmm. But they certainly could be. Um, but 
you know, on the one hand, we there's never been any effort to reach out to them because it's sort of a kind of, you know, question of research ethics when people mm -hmm. go into those kinds of encounters and find themselves archived, you know, it's never, they're never giving permission to become historical subjects. I mean, people right. don't really give permission to become historical subjects anyways, but in the kind of context of being medicalized or having a lot on the line. And of course, you know, as you get to know these people, so much about privacy and publicity and there's so much at stake so even on on that sort of grounds probably you know it's sort of iffy you know whether you know th those papers weren't housed at an official archive so maybe technically legally you could go looking for them but but one of the things i know is that i don't think there's ever been too much of a desire to in part because what we're really interested in is how no matter what version of the story you spin we could go out and find all of these people right maybe right whoever's mm -hmm. still with us talk to them but that still wouldn't really get us to some sort of you know profound truth that we didn't mm -hmm. already get to in the film and i think mm -hmm. that you know it's a question i sit with a lot of uh, you know sit with a lot um as a historian too where there are these sort of moments where you kind of just stop um and and it's weird because of course as a nerd, you just want to know everything. Um, but I think there's a kind of respect and respect for not just for privacy, but actually for the limitations of what we can know that mm -hmm. for me would sort of be about saying, let's play with the archive and let's play with these performances and not sort of, yeah. And, and, and you know, I think that we can get a lot out of that, even, even if maybe there might still be people out there. It's a really strange question to think about too, just because I actually have not thought about this till right now. I mean, I suppose someone who was one of those people might see this film, right? I, mean, right. I don't know if they do, yeah. maybe they'll let one of us know. It hasn't happened yet, but it's certainly possible. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Should I pass it off? I can. Yes. I, d I didn't want to take all the time. I, um, my other question I wanted to ask was sort of about the process of casting, which it sounds like you weren't um, a part of, but you might know it's, it seems like for a lot of the actors, it's important that all the actors are trans, but also it's more than just acting. They also sort of, yes. um, were invited to share about their own lives. And I was wondering if that's just sort of like, um, you know, how the casting process went, how important it was to have, it seemed like of all, if not most of the creative team was also trans and sort of how that went of getting everyone together. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I know enough from, from talking to Chase to, to be able to answer some of the, the details of it, but also to speak to that broader ethos, right? So, you know, each of the people who come to these performances, I mean, it's really interesting. They're all, you know, acclaimed actors and writers, poets, trans people in the world who have been doing creative and artistic work for some time, you know, been kind of racking up accolades in the last five to 10 years, sometimes, you know, very belatedly considering how genius they are. Um, but, you know, they're, they're people who also, I think, understand the particular burden of trying to sort of leverage the publicity of being a trans actor or an artist mm -hmm. or a poet or a writer into a career. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what gives each of them their sort of unique insight into the person they were being asked to bring to life or embody. I mean, even the language we pick is sort of interesting here, right? Like, mm -hmm. are they bringing someone else to life or are they also letting out a part of themselves that they already know, right? Mm -hmm. Angelica Ross, um, I think at one point, um, you know, in a different Q&A talked about relating to Georgia, almost like, you know, as a matter of oral history, you know, mm -hmm. that for her, for, you know, she was like, well, I know Georgia, I've met her, right? Not literally, but I know who that is. Um, and not even necessarily in the sense of that she's met literal people like her, she just feels that person living inside of her, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, for, for Stephen Ira playing Jimmy, there's a question of identification that gets frustrated at one moment, right? Where in one of his interviews, he says like, it's actually really alarming for me to think about there being trans youth so many decades earlier because so much of my struggle and pain was about me being the first person to have to deal with it. And it's right. kind of, you know, mind bending to think that, oh no, this has just kept happening generation after generation. So I think each of the characters, you know, I think each of the actors sort of brought a specific know-how, right, about what their sort of what their agenda is in the world, right, mm -hmm. and that that kind of helped them connect to the characters, um, and then, you know, sort of played with that relay, right. So mm -hmm. I think that's what's 
sort of interesting. I mean, even like Jen Richards has talked about, you know, Barbara isn't necessarily like her. Her. There are things that she admires about Barbara. There are ways she wish she she wishes she was more like Barbara, right? Um, but I think that you know that kind of gets to this bigger question about the team and the ensemble, which just like oh my goodness, let me say, I mean like actually a life transforming experience to not just to work with you know people who are queer and trans. You know, of course, there's a degree of you know comfort and relaxation when you're walking onto a set and you don't, you know, and we're talking about, for example, trans people being put under the spotlight and being framed. And of course, you know, that first morning I walked onto set, I was like, okay, there's literally one chair in the room and everything is pointed at where I'm going to sit. Like, okay, I know that's what the film is about, but how am I going to feel? right, being put in that position on purpose. And each of the actors had to, of course, negotiate that as well. And I, I can almost, you know, it's so interesting. I just remember this feeling though that morning of walking onto the set and being very nervous, but then looking and seeing the whole team, right? And, you know, it's like the lighting director, really accomplished trans woman who works, you know, all over in Hollywood kind of came up and was just, you know, getting and all of these moments of, of thoughtfulness, expertise, but they had this added flair, this sort of trans talent, right? And what that I think really stacks up to is a degree of trust that then lets you take more risks in your performance or get more out of the work that you're doing. And so for me, it's very, you know, it's weird. It's weird because here I am talking to all of you now, but I would say like the way, I don't know, this sort of like, the, the, the sort of version of me now that can go out on the road and talk about this film, like a lot of that comes from the actual experience of shooting this film. In mm -hmm. other words, actually being in that chair and being invited to show up, not just as a historian or an expert, but also myself, not something mm -hmm. I had necessarily felt, you know, to have happened a lot, you know, so far in my career, that has really changed how I do my work. So I think almost everyone probably has a version of that experience, but it's really when you have like this whole team, right? And then everyone can kind of spread around the burden and the work of like taking risks um, that otherwise can be really hard when you're the only kind of one person in the room, which I think is so often the case, right? We're in a moment of great strides and in inclusion in terms of representation, the kinds of people making art and culture, but it's still often a little tokenized, right? Where mm -hmm. it's like, well, you're the first woman to do this. So the first person of color to do that. And sometimes you're the only person there, right? Mm -hmm. And instead, when you have that critical capacity, when you're the majority, when it's your house, like mm, things get really really, really exciting, really fast. So I, I think that's got to be, to my mind, one of the, the secret sauces of the film. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was wonderful questions. Who's next? Is it Jason? Hello. Hi. Um, it's wonderful, wonderful to share the movie and and to get a little sneak peek before it airs tomorrow. I have many questions. Um, I'm still trying to formulate what I exactly want to ask. It may take me a minute. I think one thing in the film that really resonated with me was just the idea, like I keep coming back to the main, like the part towards the conclusion where it was, um, I can't remember the exact wording, but it was like, oh, the questions or the answers already exist. It's just the person asking the questions doesn't have them. And like that kind of discourse or that power dynamic between like the interviewer, whether that be the archive or the literal interviewer or whatever form that takes. And then the person who actually is the subject. Mm. And so I guess I was just wondering if you could talk about how you ended up like revealing that truth through the archive because in a way and again this was in the film but in a way the film is doing the exact same thing and it's just such a complicated thing that I think was expressed so clearly that I'm just wondering if you can talk about coming to that truth yeah 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 it's such it, it feels like a riddle right and I think I like the word riddle because riddles have answers but the answers don't necessarily like resolve what's interesting about them right or they're playful or they're fun or there's an aha moment but then you're like okay wait what um and i feel like you know the archive is a series of riddles to be there that you kind of watch zachary drucker's incredible uh, embodiment of agnes over the course of the film and you can feel agnes just like she has had enough of this Mike Wallace guy, right? Like she is just like, 
you're really, you know, you can see it in her micro gestures and her facial expressions in her tone of voice. And then, you know, of course, dramatically by the end, she really just turns the tables and finally is like, what kind of questions are these, right? Um, what do you even think you know? What do you think you're getting out of this and, and storms off? And I love that moment because it feels so, I mean, it feels so palpable and real as a trans person, of course, right? There are these moments where it's like, why am I still, why do I have to have this one conversation, you know, 10 times a year for my whole life? Because apparently the, none of the people who are asking me these questions, like, tell me your life story, tell me your damage, right? Apparently they're not learning anything, right? Because the, the, the sort of hamster wheel of it never ends. But the real, I think the real kind of vertigo comes from that, you know, there isn't necessarily another alternative truth that we can go all in on, right? And then I think part of the pain and the difficulty, but also the immense reward of what the film is thinking with is like, for those of us who have been burdened with that excess of, of having to always answer questions and produce false truths about ourselves, I mean, it's almost hardest for us to let go of that impulse because it's like, you know, it wounds you over time, right? When you've had to produce a sort of alienating, disorienting story and you feel more and more estranged from the truth than ever, but it can also be such a relief to do what, you know, what Agnes did and walk off set and slam the door and say, I'm done with that, right? And, and so I think for me, that's sort of, I feel like the film wants to stage that right? But it doesn't want to tell us exactly that there's like one way to go about it or that this gets us somewhere obvious, right? I think that's partly why I sort of disappear off into the, you know, at the beach at the end, because it's like, it's like, well, hold on, where is she going? Like, is her research trip over, right? Like, did she find what she came for? I don't know, right? Um, I'll keep coming back to Agnes, but I think one of the things that I've learned from Agnes, the person, and now Agnes, you know, in this film is a little bit like, well, eventually I have to let her be, right? I can't really know, was, was she just a liar and a deceitful trans woman or was she this rebel and folk hero? Which version of Agnes is real? Who was the real Agnes behind all of that? We'll never know, right? Um, but, but is there a way to, you know, give ourselves permission to luxuriate in that instead of feeling it to be one more punishment, right? For trans people not living up to the dictates of a world that has structured itself around, you know, a series of bizarre fantasies about gender and who we are, right? So I, I, I always wanna keep it really open, right? I mean, I hopefully it's not a, I mean, I think it can be very discomforting, but, but I think it's a good discomfort. And then there is that one other suggestion towards the end of the film that that's also a way of honoring people, right? And just saying like, you get to have whatever you had and we'll never really know, right? What you were really thinking. We'll never know what these people went on to do with their lives. I, I hope and I choose to believe they were wonderful, right? Um, but I also simply want to affirm that their stories don't belong to me, right? Their truths don't belong to me. And so, you know, whatever my version of truth is in my life doesn't necessarily belong to anyone else either. I don't know if that's too um, circuitous of an answer, but you you asked the question so beautifully, so I was trying to do justice to it. Thank you very much. I think that was a wonderful answer. I think wonderfully sensitive to almost the same thing that I said with the film with the, the, the politics of visibility, truth, and staging. Mm. I think the answer carried that as well. Um, but, oh, we've got another another guest. Yes, please, please. Here's Ankita. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, hello. Hi. So my first question, um, and I think you talked about this a little bit, but I'm really curious about how you all, you and the rest of the team went about interpreting the transcripts because there's so much about micro gestures and you don't actually know what the tone was, you just know the words. So I'm curious mm -hmm. what that process was like and yeah, just how you went about it. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, one of the answers is that there was no standard way that anyone went about it. So sometimes you'll actually see it happening in real time, right? I mean, there's, of course, with Agnes, there was the unusual thing where there were some recordings, right? And so you, you get to see Zachary listening and kind of figuring out how she wants to do Agnes's voice. But that wasn't the case for anyone else, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the, you know, one of the kind of tricky, interesting moments in the film where we just see that happen is, you know, when um, when Chase is talking um, um, 
uh, with Maxwell Filario about Henry and, and about the fact that, you know, we think maybe, you know, he died potentially by suicide. I mean, that that is one of those moments, right, where like the interpretation is sort of being created in real time, being co-constructed. But actually, I think the whole film, right, um, not to be too meta, but I actually think the entire film is a reckoning with the interpretation of those transcripts, right? Because then when we kind of, you know, zoom back out into uh, a directorial conversation or just a friendly conversation between Chase and, you know, one of the actors, that's also about figuring out how to interpret the transcripts in part because it's so much about trying to understand what each of the actors brings to and feels, you know, through these performances. But then I think the other, you know, maybe two other things I would name, actually a lot of it is is about the costuming and the colors, um, you know, there's just like the beautiful mid-century tones that we see in some of those outfits. That was part, that's a big interpretation, right? Because we don't know what these people look like. Um, and then the other thing is actually the work of the camera, right? There's so much um, disruption of a kind of reverse shot moment, you know, where you're supposed to turn around and figure out, oh, wait, wait, who are we really talking to? What's really going on? And, and the film is kind of like, well, maybe there's 10 different versions of an answer to that. So I kind of think all of those are were the interpretive kind of mechanisms. Although when it came to each of the performances, that was totally basically up to the actors. Um, but then I think my sense is there wasn't a lot of over preparation. I think Chase really wanted that to happen um, kind of on camera, right? And so a lot of what you're seeing, is it happening? Um, and I think there's so much like, just think about again, you know, it's like whenever Georgia like smooths out her her outfit or, or you know, or, you know, whatever Agnes like looks in a certain direction or, you know, whenever Barbara laughs in that little Barbara way, like those, I think that some of that just like was not improvisational, but a lot of it really was kind of organic and kind of worked itself out through production. So yeah, it, it's, it's kind of, I think, I think that's a good thing because, you know, the transcripts were not necessarily used in a literal verbatim way either. So there's, you know, there's like, once it gets going and it feels fluid and there's a little bit of, you know, derivation from the original, but that's, that's, mm -hmm. you know, kind of, kind of, I think on purpose. Yeah. 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 Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have one more question. Can I? Please. Yeah. Okay, great. So this one might be a little more loaded. Um, great. But this was, um, this was from, uh, I also remember Georgia was talking about uh, how she, you know, she's never met the person that she's sort of embodying, but she sort of feels that. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering in recreating the scenes, um, how did sort of you and the rest of the team feel about the differences and, and or the similarities between sort of the support structures that were mentioned in the 60s when it was taking place versus now. And I, I was, it was clear that there was a lot of relation and a lot of people who were acting felt in many ways that they were going through similar experiences to what, you know, the interviewees went through. So I was curious what, how you felt when you were watching all this and how you felt when you were acting. And, and yeah, I mean, it's incredibly strange right i mean it's not a form it's not a clean form of identification right there's certainly aspects of some of these people's stories that resonate in weird ways right i think one version of that is this sort of you know barometer of you know lack of political progress <laughs> the trans like uh, to be to be frank right there's a lot going on in in 2022 that's quite extreme and actually unprecedented but in another way i mean the stuff that you know these people are going through in the 1950s it's the stuff that trans people are going through still right we have actually not achieved any escape velocity from some of these central dilemmas i think particularly the kind of standoff that is medicine. That hasn't really, I mean, it has improved, right? But it's not fundamentally gone. I mean, I think about this all the time because I like often have to go to UCLA, you know, to like speak at a conference. I have colleagues there, right? And it's like, you go to this place and it's like, okay, well, this isn't just something that happened a long time ago. Like there's still people doing research on trans people at UCLA today. There are still research ethics problems that trans folks at UCLA have had to organize against, right? I work at, you know, probably the most infamous uh, medical school. I don't work at medical school, but Johns Hopkins is, you know, the most infamous medical school um, in terms of trans medicine in the U.S. And we're trying to figure out now, right? It's like, well, well, what do we want to do with that legacy, right? It's it's not over, right? The history is not over, and so I think that's part of it. 
it, but at the same time, it's really odd because of course, you know, the 1950s to today, it's a big time jump. And there's a lot that of course, you know, just don't relate to, right? I mean, it's just a different world. It's not just aesthetically different. I mean, you think just about the mobility, right? Like for, for Georgia, we're talking about Jim Crow 1950s, LA being segregated in a particular way at that time, right? Um, you know, and, and so there, there are these sorts of abrupt kind of like, oops, but not really, right? Where you can't fully kind of follow through on that. So I feel like to me that generates both I mean, a lot of emotion, a lot of feeling, um, but but also, you know, I don't know. There, there's something there's something a little galvanizing about it too. And what I mean, what I mean by that is, it feels important to me. And I think that one of the things that you know I'm proud to, you know, to see happen with the film, right, is that, you know, you don't necessarily look backward in time to find your story or to say, oh, thank goodness, someone in the past was exactly like me. I don't think that that's a sort of consumptive model where we make people in the past do stuff for us. We're not here to rescue those people. They're not there to rescue us. But, but I think it feels a certain way to be able to walk in the world today and say, well, I walk with Barbara and Agnes and Georgia and Jimmy, right? And Henry, I walk with them, um, not necessarily you know, obviously not literally, but, you know, I think that that matters to me. Um, it's not just, it's, so it's not history, trans history as in here's your origin story. That's not what we have to discover or find, but it is trans history as in um, not having to go through that thing that Stephen Ira testifies to, feeling like, oh, no one's ever done this before, so I'm literally improvising an entire way of life. That's really really hard to pull off. I mean, it's still a thing that trans people have to do all the time. Um, but I do hope, right, that having this kind of, and watching the actors embody these people from the past also invites people who are watching the film to do the same thing, right? And I, and I think that's what we're called to do, right? We might have a, you might have a Barbara moment sometime in the next few weeks, <laughs> right? We're just doing something and all of a sudden you're like, oh yeah, you know, that kind of reminds me of that person from the movie, right? You know, uh, you know, hope you don't have to have a lot of Agnes moments, but you know, whatever, right? Like this is kind of, it's, it's a strange fact of how, you know, I often feel as a historian, I'm like, did we ever leave 1958 or are we still stuck in that? You know, so there's something kind of interesting about that to me, um, but, but mostly I think I would just say it generates a lot of feeling, definitely yeah. a lot of emotions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Wonderful questions. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, first off, that was an amazing film. Thank you. Um, and I guess as I was watching it, I was wondering, um, well, first I was wondering about like, if the the transcripts and the archive was like online if it, and if it was something that we could explore um, somehow digitally. And then I was thinking about it more and I was like, oh, maybe I don't want to do that at all because of the <laughs> this seems kind of like actually probably pr reading through it, it, it seems like it might've been kind of mm. awful actually as an experience. Um, mm. I don't know. And I guess I was wondering if you'd be able to speak to um, I guess your experience as like a trans person and also as a historian and how you sort of deal with going into these archives, which has been really violently framed and still being able to like extract narratives and interact with narratives that like have a personal bearing on yourself um, and like how you sort of navigate that without just like going insane or completely like shutting yourself off from that uh, work. Well, sometimes you do have to just go a little insane, but um, you know, nothing wrong with that, right? No, I, I love that question. It's really thoughtful. And and just to say, um, just to answer the first part of it, yeah, you know, the the materials that Chase and Kristen, Kristen Schilt, you know, who's a sociologist, was the sort of way into um those papers, kind of unprocessed papers of Harold Garfinkel after he passed away. And so they weren't part of a formal archival repository. And this was sort of, you know, and this is kind of sometimes how like nuts and bolts stuff gets done, right? You, you're like, okay, someone's garage is full of boxes, right? And you don't, you actually don't even know what's in, right? You can't, you can't, you might have a hunch and you kind of start to go up to someone and be like, okay, okay, like, 
let me hang out in your garage for a few months, right? Let me process these papers for you. I'm gonna do this work for you, but in return, you know, I'm, I wanna see what's in there, right? That's how they, you know, literally took a crowbar to a filing cabinet and found these transcripts. So because it's that, that was only a few years ago, um, yeah, the, the, they're not part of a formal collection yet, right? So I don't know, I'm not sure what the plans are. If there are any, will they end up at UCLA? Kind of seems like a fitting place, maybe they will. But at the moment, yeah, they're not available, um, you know, for better and for worse, as you so, I think, thoughtfully alluded to. But this broader question, I mean, it's really key for me. I, I think about it a lot, um, you know, because the, the book that I wrote about the history of how trans children were medicalized, I mean, yeah, you gotta you gotta take care of yourself if you're gonna do that work. And in fact, I'm not sure I did super well while I was researching it. But, 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 I, I, let me let me tell it in the form of a story. This is, I think, one of the interesting ways that this plays out. So I, you know, when I was spending a lot of time at Johns Hopkins, I was way up. They have this medical archives that are kind of a little bit north of the city, a little tucked away, really kind of pretty, but quiet, isolated. And I'd been in there for ages and I knew there were all these records I wanted to look at um, from a hospital, you know, where intersex and trans people were seen from sort of the 19 teens to the 1950s or 60s. Um, but we realized that, oh, those records aren't here. They must be somewhere else. And it turned out that they were um, in the basement of, uh, of a hospital, like uh, the current Johns Hopkins Hospital, which, you know, also houses its medical records office. So like if I wanted my medical records, I could call as a patient and it would go to this office. And so first of all, we had to create this elaborate system because I wasn't allowed to take any information, identifying information out of these archives. So we had to create this complicated, weird code system, fax, remember faxes? We had to fax it um, to the other building. I had to drive across town and show up with this weird code, right? So I'm showing up on this one day and I want to find the files of this particular person, um, you know, who was a black patient in the 1930s who had been written about in a textbook. And I was like, okay, the way that this person was written about is really weird by a white surgeon. And I was like, ah, that there's more going on here. So I would love to read the original medical files, which should be there. So show up that day, you know, and then go down into the basement of what used to be the psychiatric hospital. So I'm already like, heart is racing just like, because I'm like, this is not a safe place. Um, but that's where the medical records office is kept. And I meet the person who is the head of the medical records, who's a white woman and the entire staff of the office otherwise are all black women. And so there's this white woman in charge and she takes me to this closet and she's like, okay, I think they're in here. And we open the closet. And I'm like, they're just boxes of printer paper and toner. What are you talking about? This is a supply closet. And she's like, oh no, see over there. And then there are all these microfilm boxes of medical records. And I was like, okay, so we just discovered a HIPAA law violation, but that's whatever, you know, I'm not here to be nosy. But I was like, why are you keeping these in a non-air conditioned closet? Like it was so humid in there. First of all, found out half the records were gone. So don't know where those went. They're just not there anymore. Um, that's in and of itself a really serious issue. But anyways, I finally find some of these and um, I'm sitting on the microfilm machine and it breaks down and I'm like, okay, this is really going really well. So they're like, oh, don't worry. There's another one in the room where all the medical records personnel work. So I have to intrude on these people's workspace. So I'm sitting down, you know, going through the, I feel so embarrassed. I'm like, I can't believe I'm getting in the way of these people's jobs. Um, but then they start talking to me and they're like, hey, um, what are you looking for? And I was like, oh, I'm researching, you know, intersex and trans people um, who went to Johns Hopkins, you know, 70, 80 years ago. And I'm really interested in the role of race in the clinic and racism. And they were like, oh, well, have you found any stories of like experiments, you know, on, on black people's gender? And I was like, well, tell me more about what you mean. And we started having this long conversation about all of the stories that these women had been told growing up in Baltimore from a young age. Um, these are stories that go back centuries actually in Baltimore, you know, in the black community to not walk alone at night around the Johns Hopkins hospitals because there were, you know, stories about people being kidnapped and stolen off the streets for experiments and all of this kind of, you know, sort of um, community knowledge about the real and long legacy of, of violent anti-black um, medical experiments at Hopkins. And so, you know, this whole day, 
day that I thought was a kind of a disaster where I wasn't finding anything I wanted and was just feeling really down about the whole experience became this really interesting kind of moment where I got to, you know, hear from people, you know, who actually work in this place and who live in that community. And that to me, I guess, you know, I like that story because to me, it speaks to the ambivalence and the contradiction of the whole endeavor, right? It is really painful to sit and read the worst, I mean, medical record, it's like the worst stuff you can read, right? These are just doctor's notes. It's not very nice stuff, right? The patients never talk. <laughs> um, their perspective isn't there. It's very dehumanizing. And, you know, I talk about like early mid 20th century doctors. These people have confidence verging on arrogance that I'm not sure has ever been replicated on earth, right? They just think everything they <laughs> say is absolutely like the word of God, right? Um, so it's not super fun to sit with that, but then there are these unexpected moments and they're not necessarily moments where you find something in the archive that challenges that system because you probably don't find much of that at all. But these other moments where it, all of a sudden that day, I was like, oh, everything I'm doing is in a new context for me because here I am in the basement of the actual building where this stuff happened. And I'm talking to people who still work here and we're putting this Hopkins back into this neighborhood, into this black neighborhood in East Baltimore. And that to me, like that I think is why you do it, right? Of course you do it because you want to find out, right? It's like, there's got to be a lot of stuff there. You got to go looking, right? Um, but of course, no one has to, and like, don't do archival research if it's just going to make you feel bad, right? But there are these other kinds of moments of solidarity and sociality that, you know, might not even have anything to do with what you're looking at in records. And that, to me, I mean, I think about that day a lot when I'm when I'm getting the courage to go back into places that I don't necessarily always want to. Yeah, so very long answer to your question, but I uh, couldn't resist. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Jules. Hi. Um, so good to see you. It's nice to see you too. Yeah, um, I loved this film. And I think something I was thinking about a lot when you said this phrase trans talent a few questions back, mm. um, I was thinking so much about like the campiness of the whole endeavor. Right. You know, like I loved it. And you know, you're like, yeah, it ends like you're walking into the sea. Like Chase <laughs> Joint is also these like cis doctors, you know, like. And also all of the trans people who are acting in the film are people who are already visible as trans mm. in the world for their cultural production and cultural work. Mm. And then, you know, you're talking about like in the film itself, right? You're talking about like, actually maybe everyone who's not in the record is really lucky and was having a much better time, like not being scrutinized. Yeah. And so I'm just kind of thinking about like, you know, both like, what it means to like leave people the fuck alone and like not need them to be like research subject subjects and like experiments and also what it means to like reach into the history that's not documented and you know I'm thinking about like Sadia Hartman's critical fabulations and like all that good stuff and then I'm thinking about like you know right now I'm reading um the terrible we uh oh, Cameron Robert that. Rich's book about like trans maladjustment thinking with trans maladjustment and like, there's this amazing moment where he talks about like how prior to 1989, like trans and disabled were like really linked like in medical and legal policy in all these ways. Anyway, so then I'm just thinking about like, how do we like refuse and refuse and refuse like as trans people to be objects and to want to know about ourselves and like to do this film is like in a certain way, kind of a performance of our, of like trans people doing being trans. Mm. Um, and like who is it mm. for and I, like and I think I'm just curious yeah how you think with like the film sort of going to these lengths of performance that are quite extra and like totally surprised me by being like really beautiful and really exciting mm. oh well what an elegant elegant reading and question thank you I mean I'm so with you I think one of those ways is by being campy and around different right but but it's not just because that that kind of calls bullshit on you know on the situation that that you find yourself in right and of course this is partly our investment right was was agnes really that salty <laughs> with harold garfinkel i don't know right um you know 
could any straight white man ever be as hilarious as Chase Joint playing a straight, you know, cis white man? I don't know, probably not, right? But there's there's a rhyme and a reason to that superlative. Um, and, and part of what I think it is, is that it actually communicates a kind of poison confidence Right. So it's sort of a mode of reframing the entire situation, reframing the entire world. And I think, you know, it's it's not it's not an easy thing to do. I thought a lot about this because I feel like I've had to work so hard to do this in my professional life where it's like when I walk in, I don't want to explain why I need to be respected. I want people to, to see and feel from me the way that I command respect, right? And part of that can be intimidating, right? And I think it's a good reason to be intimidating, but actually, you know, being campy or humorous, right? Part of what that communicates is like, oh, to all of this, don't worry about that. I see through everything going on here. I understand everything about this scenario and I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it so well. I can also make fun of it and laugh at the same time, right? It's an ancient gay art um, and not for nothing has it been perfected by a lot of trans people, especially trans women. But I think that's really important, right? Because it's like, we need to, we need to I think we all need to feel that when we're watching these performances to know they're a little too much um, because that that's communicating something urgent and something political about that situation, right? And so it's it doesn't make it insincere. And, and I love the way that you were talking about that, right? It actually can still be really beautiful and have these kind of haunting sort of intense kind of real moments. Um, but I think it's so important. Like, you know, it's like my other, my my campy moment in the film, since I wasn't playing any characters, was the one time I tried to do my best Christine Jorgensen, which is just like, you know, this like mid-Atlantic transsexual voice I've had stuck in my head for, you know, God knows how long. And um, that wasn't planned. I don't know. I was just like, I really, because I was like, I remember, you know, saying to Chase, I was like, I know we have to talk about Christine Jorgensen because like truly not that many people really know that much about her, but I'm like, all I feel like I ever get to do is start every conversation about trans history with Christine Jorgensen. And I'm so bored of her. Like she's just this like beautiful blonde, blonde bland, um, you know, uh, you know, white girl from the Bronx. Like, I, you know, like the most interesting thing about her is that her, his, her family is Danish like okay that's that that don't impress me much but but in that moment you know for me I mean again it wasn't planned but like taking on that moment to do a little Christine camp you know part of that to me wasn't just the pleasure of getting to like say like okay well if you want me to tell you a story audience then you're gonna let me tell you the story the way I want to part of it is also pedagogical right it's trying to cue up to a public audience that like this person who you're going about to see, you know, in newsreel footage is playing a role because she was pigeonholed by American culture to be fictional, right? I mean, it's like, like she really had that impossible job. How do you walk off that tarmac and be a blonde bombshell, right? Like that's probably not what she really wanted to do with her life, but it was a shot, right? And she got to do it. Like she had a cabaret act for decades. She wasn't a very good singer or dancer, right? But she did it, right? And that's funny, you know, it's a little tragic, but it's really funny. And I think that that feeling of like wanting to make sure that the trans people in the film get the last laugh. Like that, the, to me, there's a little bit of, of, of a political valence to that, right? It's a little bit of reminding people like, you know, and I guess I would put it this way, if I had to define trans talent, it's like trans people are forced into situations where we have to work um, a thousand times harder than other people to do the same things, basic, basic stuff, right? Like know who you are, get dressed, have a name, go out in the world, get a job, walk down the street, right? And so what that means is that over time we become so incredibly good at those things, right? We have a sociological or anthropological um, repertoire or understanding of the world much bigger than most people's. And we actually become so good at performance, right? We can start to take pleasure in in playing with the genre a little bit. Lots of kinds of people have to do this, right? A lot of minoritized people, but I think, you know, trans people, particularly trans women, it's like, ah, who does it better? And so I'm so glad that the film like sort of shows that, but doesn't necessarily tell that, right? It's just like, it's just showing it. So it's like, it's there for the audience, right? And I often think that, you know, making people laugh is 
generally a good way of like letting something pretty uncomfortable sink in because no one likes to be sort of, you know, talked down to or taught at too much. Um, so I also think it's just like, you got to laugh, right? I mean, oh gosh, don't we all just need to laugh, especially these days? Um, but like, you know, when I think about what it must have been like to, to do those things in the 50s, I'm like, those people better have been laughing because it's actually hilarious, right? Imagine having to go to um, UCLA and sit down with an eminent sociologist who wants to ask you about your life. That's absurd, right? It's actually a situation comedy. It's so ridiculous. You have to respond to that by assuming that it's, it's, it's hilarious, right? Because you can't take that seriously because it's demeaning to take that seriously because there's nothing serious about that kind of male expertise, right? Um, so I think it's just sort of playing with that really serious, heavy stuff, right? But doing it in a kind of light way um, that hopefully makes it bearable. <laughs> So anyways, I'm, I'm threatening to ramble here, but um, but I just, your question was so beautifully layered. I wanted to, to, to really get at it. Thanks. Thank you. You also want to thank you so much for giving us so much this evening. Uh, it was really great to hear you after the film. We've got so much to think about. So a round of applause and say good night. Thank you. Oh, thank you all. Such incredible questions. I really, really, really appreciate it. And thank you all for coming out and, and watching and supporting the film. Uh, good luck tomorrow. Oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> well, now I'm all wrapped up for it. So I appreciate it. <laughs> <It's a> rehearsal. <laughs> right. Take yeah. care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.